You don't pulse audio? Okay, there we go. I think we've done it. You don't pulse audio? Okay, there we go. I think we've done it. I apologize, guys. So I was... All right, let's mute that so I don't echo. Um, I was uh, trying to stream from my Mac because that's how I normally have things set up, right? And somewhere along the way, since I was encoding the videos for the pre-recorded stuff from my Mac, it completely broke OBS. OBS on the Mac, just, I don't know, man. I can't, I can't ever get it to do what I want. Uh, and so it was like saying I was streaming and it wasn't. And apparently it actually streamed for about 15 seconds with that loading screen. On my end, it just said it was streaming continu continu continuously. Uh, and so whatever. Now, now we're, we're over here on the, the Linux box. Just never touch OBS and, and things will be fine. Okay. It, it's always OBS, man. I don't know how, how professional streamers do it. So uh, today, what are we doing? What are we doing? We are, I'm discombobulated now because I threw this together. Uh, we are here on Pwn College. We're taking a look at the dojo. We are on CSE 598. This is a makeup stream for the failed stream that occurred yesterday. So we are looking at level four. So let's, let's finish off this thought here. Yeah, replace a failed stream with a failed stream, right? Uh, what, what, what are you going to do? Okay, so here I am on level four. Let's start fresh. We have Tmux. Hopefully, make a window that doesn't cover my head. Uh, we will uh, VM start and We'll take a look at this kernel module. So level four is a little bit interesting because there are no function pointers. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is there are pre-recorded lecture videos, not all of them, uh, but I did manage to get uh, this first one up, which is just kind of uh, how we can think about the kernel heap. And then the second one, uh, which focuses on kernel uh, protections, uh, which are the different mitigation techniques uh, that are used here. So for instance, level three says, hey, there's KASLR. Uh, we talk about KASLR in one of these pre-recorded videos. Uh, the last uh, pre-recorded video, I'm putting off a little bit because I want to throw together a couple good demos. Um, not like start to finish, but a, a couple explainer um, things, which is a bit more than what I had in the earlier two, uh, just as far as understanding why uh, we want to do some of these things. But the, the last pre-recorded lecture video really only applies to, I want to say six, seven, eight. Uh, so right now you should be able to make it through uh, to five. Uh, what do we got here? Twitch says, uh, honestly, not sure how the function pointer helps me in level three. Uh, but I guess four solves both, right? So the, the function pointer doesn't help you defeat KASLR, right? I, like, I think you know the answer. I just don't know why you're not um, taking a crack at it here. So if we look at the very end of this, KASLR, your logic is still get a leak, compute an offset, right? So how, how, do, you, how do you get a leak? Well, you can do a kernel oops. As long as the kernel isn't compiled to panic on oops, which level three is not, you can get the kernel to output uh, some kind of function pointer. Uh, someone says, forget the leak. How do I call anything if you have nothing to call? Uh, you had nothing to call in level three? Level three has the, level three has a function pointer. Uh, Twitch says, 
commit creds, you can't get the address to any functions. Well, that's that's the whole point of KASLR, right? Like, if I'm... Am I in the VM over here? Uh, VM connect. Like, I'll show... And we'll VM debug over in the bottom right. Okay, so you say forget the leak, which is great, because this is literally what I demoed in the pre-recorded um, lecture video. So if we, for instance, grep KL Sims, and I want to get an it cred. So I don't care how we got the leak, but you, you seem content that I can make the kernel loops. And so you get some kernel address, right? This one we happen to know is an it cred, but I don't care, right? Is, is this this where you're at? Okay, I have some kernel address I can leak. We'll make sure we're starting at the same point. The answer is yes. Okay, so then, then this is just a matter of math and KASLR. So I have some leak. In this case, I'm getting it from um, KALSIMS instead of um, a kernel loops, but that, that doesn't really matter. Uh, what I'm going to do is source opt pt dump, uh, pt.py, this is probably not going to work, yeah. Uh, so this particular plugin needs to run as root. So we're going to sudo um, debug, or sudo vm debug, so that we can use this plugin. opt pt dump, pt.py. Now we don't really need pt.py for our exploit. This is just to help us kind of understand what it is that we're doing and what's going on. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I think I showed this, uh, PT dump uh, outputs all of the virtual memory, uh, including kernel memory. So it's very similar to Jeff's VM map, right? Except VM map just shows us user land. Uh, here we get to see uh, user land as well as kernel land, kernel space. So I have some leak. My leak is this thing right here. So if I use PT, I can say has, the pointer that I've leaked is in this region of memory. And the claim is that this address is contiguous with the beginning of the kernel, right? the base address of where the kernel's loaded into memory. Since it's KASLR, these, I believe it's these three, uh, these three nibbles uh, will get randomized every boot. But what I care about is the offset from the beginning of the kernel to my leak. So if I print my leak, and we subtract the base address of the kernel, this is my magic offset. Uh, this is my magic offset uh, from init cred to kernel base. And I show in the pre-recorded lecture videos that these reasons of memory uh, do directly follow each other. So I do not need to get a leak from right here. A leak from anything that's tagged as kernel is sufficient for me to do this math. So now I have that leak, right? Uh, one thing that, uh, what, did somebody, what did somebody say they want to call? Commit creds? Commit cred. So let's say I want to call commit cred, because init cred is in the data section. That's not something I could call into, right? So let's get commit cred. Cool. This is also at some constant offset from the kernel base. So that's my commit kids address. And then the other thing I need is the kernel base, which is right here. Uh, magic offset from kernel base to commit creds. And, and these are just some constant.
Uh, you you say you uh, Twitch says sorry. I explained myself poorly. Uh, even if I have all the leaks in base, I'm unsure how to hijack control flow. Well, that's that's a different question. That's not <laughs> that's not not what was being uh, being asked. I'm gonna finish this this thought uh, first here though. So. Uh, right now, uh, we have obtained these leaks, and we've obtained these leaks in debug mode, right? Uh, we can uh, VM restart, and the reason I'm going to do that is because I want ASLR to, or KASLR to re-randomize, right? So this is the equivalent of I'm working in practice mode and finding my offsets. Then I'm going to start it up in challenge mode because I want to obtain the flag. So now everything's re-randomized. And my claim is, is that I'll be able to find the base address of the kernel, and I'll also be able to find the address of commit creds. All right. So the thing that I am allowed to give myself here is the address of a init cred, because that is what I'm claiming I can leak. If we grep correctly here. All right. So this is the one thing that I get to know. Uh, we're going to do our math inside of GDB. But we certainly don't need to. We could do the math in Python. It's just convenient to me uh, to use GDB. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. That looks fine. We're still going to source um, opt pt dump pt dot pi. Cool. So my math here was we print my leak minus the first magic constant. All right, and we can set. We'll call it current base uh, equal to that so now i can print current base and this is where well, this is my calculated kernel base okay? uh, and in turn i can also set my calculated commit cred to be current base plus my second magic offset here okay so now these i didn't pull them from the binary i calculated them based upon my lead. Uh, hopefully math works. We can use PT, say has, and I'm going to say what region has my kernel base. Well, it turns out the kernel base address is uh, located in the region that is at the beginning. And we see that this is the beginning. My kernel base is the kernel base. Right. So math works there. Uh, the other thing that I want to verify is that commit creds that I calculated it correctly from the base uh, to the symbol. So let's verify that, not in GDB, uh, but over here from proc KL sims. Uh, what was I looking for? Commit creds. And what we should see is this uh, B8 BB0. That is what we see right here. Commit creds uh, B8 BB0. And so this is how we can leverage a leak to find uh, locations that we're interested in. Uh, not only functions to call, uh, but members in the data segment that may be interesting to overwrite or read. Uh, so, and we could use this same technique uh, to find the address of ROP gadgets uh, that we're interested in, uh, despite the addresses being randomized. Okay, uh, so that completes the question that you didn't ask. Uh, let's see what the question is that you, you are going for here. Uh, so, uh, you're unsure how to hijack control flow. Uh, the first two levels, and you describe the vulnerability that exists there. Um, but after, okay, so level three, you don't have the same uh, like initial vulnerability to start building from. And somebody else here says that you do get a use after free. Uh, that can overwrite things. Mm. Okay. So 
So I think this, uh, that's, that's interesting because I didn't think the difficulty, uh, let me think how I want to, we're going to, we're going to go for some ASCII art here. All right, so this, if I, yes, yeah, it's not, not perfect. Let's grab just this. All right, this is my slab. And what you have here, um, is when I allocate something, I get a pointer to one of these segments, right? And so we can get multiple of these pointers and our vulnerability is that we have the ability to uh, free. So in levels three and four, so we actually can see this here, maybe five even. Uh, if we look at Kheap Ioctal, uh, the actions that we can perform are copy from user. So that's where we're going to read data from uh, one of these slots. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can free a object. So we could free an object that is in one of these slots. Uh, and then the last thing we can do is we can uh, copy or copy from user writes. So we can write from user land into a slot. Uh, we can free an object from a slot and then we can copy to user, which means we can read the data in the slot. And so this, having these abilities Right? And we notice that when we free an object in a slot, uh, we are nulling out the pointer uh, that's being used. In this case, the pointer is uh, an offset. So this says R12.1, where R12.1 is an offset from uh, R1 of Ioctal. Uh, but if I were to open this up in IDA, this would show that it is the file pointer's private data. And so we don't see that pointer being nulled, right? which means that we where R12.1 is used again here in, for instance, the copy, we can copy from user, we can overwrite uh, the slot after it's been freed. And then with copy to user, uh, we can read after that pointer uh, has been freed. And so this, this is actually not really a kernel specific scenario. This is kind of a generic um, the heat problem of how do I create um, use after free? And then how do I leverage a use after free to create another primitive? Right? Uh, because that is what a lot of this builds up to. Uh, so the, the core concept here, because remember that for slub in glibc uh, t will say tcache. I like this tcache reference. It, it, it may not be the best mental model here, uh, but we have this um, linked list, right? Of uh, freed chunks. And then there is some next pointer. And so what do we do uh, with a use after free in glibc heap. Like what, what can we do? Well, then the first question you might want to ask is, well, what data is available to read or write from a freed chunk? And this is just in glibc tcache, right? 
Uh, the, the answer there is, well, we could read whatever data happened to be there already, right, from the allocation. But it's not specific to like a use after free scenario. The other thing that we can read is this next pointer. And this next pointer is a powerful thing to be able to interact with. If I can read the next pointer, then I have leaked a heap address. We're going to ignore safe linking for our purposes here. Uh, if I can write the next pointer, then I can control what pointer will get returned from an alloc call or from a malloc call. Okay, so this makes sense, hopefully, for the T cache, right? If we go back several modules, I have to give it a few seconds for Twitch. Okay, we're in agreement. So Twitch is on board with uh, everything I wrote up here about the T cache. Let's apply a similar logic to the kernel heap. So we have kernel heap, specifically. Uh, the slub implementation of the slab allocator. Uh, it is a linked list of freed slots. It uses a next pointer. Uh, what can we do with a use after free uh, in the kernel heap? Well, we ask the same question. Uh, what data is available to read write from a freed slot? And it's still whatever data happened to be there uh, from the allocation, which isn't particularly interesting in our scenario, uh, but we also have a next pointer because it's a singly linked list. Uh, what can we do with the next pointer? We can do these, these exact same actions. So why, somebody says, isn't a isn't it a pointer to a pointer? Uh, clarify on what you mean when you say it. We're going to go down here and play with their ASCII art in a few. But I want to make sure that we we understand that these two relate as just like broad heap concepts. Right? The data structure that's being used to relate um, allocations after they're freed is still a, a singly linked list. And, and the location of the next pointer is slightly different, um, but that's not, not the end of, end of the world there for us. Uh, okay, so they're talking about how the structure is intended to be used. I'm not, gonna, not going to uh, go there yet. So, if I have two pointers, right, we malloc them, uh, which we may have to, and when I say malloc, I don't mean that we literally call malloc, right? Everything that we do to interact with the kernel and kind of interact with this kernel heap uh, has to do with either interacting with the kernel module or like triggering some type of syscall to cause the kernel to execute some specific piece of code, right? We, we aren't writing literally malloc when I say this. And so this, this uh, saying malloc call is a bit of a misnomer, uh, but as long as you understand that when I say malloc, I really mean um, like k malloc or what is it? KMM cache alloc, I think. Um, that is what I really mean when I say malloc. Uh, then, then we're in, in good shape. Okay. So if we think about what is on this slab here, uh, what we see is I could... How many do I need here? Let me think. Yeah, I can do this with two. Uh, so if I malloc... Um, if we somehow malloc uh, pointer one, then we malloc pointer two, 
Then we free pointer, and we, we get back pointer two, right? Or slot two. Um, uh, we can free pointer two, then we can free pointer one. What have we done to our, our heap here? Well, we've placed a next pointer right here. And then pointer two, our slot, this slot right here that's being accessed by pointer two, uh, has a next pointer that is null. And remember, these next pointers are located midway in the slot. Uh, they aren't at the very beginning of the slot, like what we see in uh, Tcache. Now, what, does, what was my vulnerability that we identified? We said we have a use after free, right? We, we get this for free. So how can I use this? And we said we can read and we can write. Well, if I can write, I can overwrite that next pointer and determine what gets returned. If I read, I get this leak but I'm trying to get control flow. So what do I really want to control? Now in level three, what does the kernel object we're messing with look like? Right, right now, this is just kind of represented as a bunch of slots, but we can do a little bit better. If we break this up, this is a little bit fancy doing our, our kernel. Uh, we have some pointer, right, which is a, a function pointer. Yeah. Then we have uh, data. Right. This is the layout. Uh, of the kernel object um, in the slot. So ideally, if we want to get control flow, well, a good target is to write uh, or overwrite the function pointer then trigger uh, the function pointer to get called. Uh, and this is likely what you did in the earlier levels, right? The levels, uh, I think, one and two, if I remember right. So, so this is our strategy. But our problem is just levels one and two, as you point out, uh, had a out-of-bounds write. And so we could kind of flow from one chunk to the next. And, but we don't have that here. Instead, we have this use after free. So I want to turn a use after free primitive into an arbitrary write. Well, we'll call this thinking in primitives. How can I do that? Just generically thinking about the heat. What do we do? Well, we said, going up here with our generic logic, overwriting the next pointer controls what gets returned from the mallet call. So if I overwrite this next pointer, that gives me an arbitrary pointer. So then if I, over here, we, yeah, let's bring this down. Chink. Operations. Now I get the use after free. So we use use after free to overwrite the next pointer in, uh, I'm going to call it pointer one. Um, we'll say from pointer one. Right, from this first point. And so we have that ability from the use after free. We can overwrite this next pointer just by using 
uh, copy from user on the freed pointer. We can overwrite this. So that allows us to determine uh, what gets returned here. Now, the, the next thing will be is, well, okay, well, what do I want to, but what do we write? That, that's a fair question. Well, what if instead of just immediately writing, we use the use after free uh, to read the next pointer? What does that give me? Uh, somebody says, but I need an area you can control. So remember, our initial goal here, our strategy, is to overwrite this function pointer. And my problem is, is that when I copy to and from uh, user data into the kernel, I can, I don't, you're not overwriting a uh, do print, you're overwriting the function pointer that happens to be do print. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear there. So the, the kernel object allows you to copy into this data spot, right? But since these slots are right next to each other, um, what we can do is we can get, this will give me, if I read from the next pointer, I get um, pointer two, right? I get the address of a slot. So if I were to take the address of a slot and which is pointer two, well, let's write pointer two minus, I don't know, hex 10. What have we done? This next pointer is now uh, pointer to minus x10. Uh, this just gets to be a fat chunk or fat slot. Have I just broken my entire? Yeah, and that's not too bad. Okay, so this is now uh, pointer to minus x10. And so what happens when I call malloc? If I were to re-malloc from here. The first malloc will give me pointer. The second malloc will give me a pointer, a pointer minus hex tab. And so what I've done is I've created a made up slot that gets to chill right here. Oh, I don't know how to make a, oh wait, that's the letter V. What am I talking about? I've, I've kind of invented a fake slot that sits right behind the true slot. And so this now gives me the ability, if I were to copy, and it doesn't need to be hex 10, right? It just needs to be some location that is um, behind the true slot, such that the data section here, because remember this is split between pointer and data. Now that I have this fake slot, I can use the copy from user 
against this made up slot that I've created. And the data section of the made up slot overlaps with the pointer, the function pointer here of the second slot I've created. Now these don't have to actually be right next to each other, right? Uh, slot two, this pointer two could be over here. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I just happen to place them right next to each other because we aren't actually using the locality of the two slots uh, in this exploit. Uh, what we are abusing is the fact that we can read that free list next pointer uh, and then write that free list next pointer. So now we can write uh, to our um, fake slot uh, to corrupt the function pointer in, um, we're going to call it pointer to slot. And so conceptually, this is what you're trying to do. This is very similar. Well, what are we doing? We're leveraging corrupting the next pointer to allow us to read write to some location we're interested in. In this example, or the, the like this scenario, the location that we're interested in uh, corrupting happens to be already on the heap. But if instead, uh, what if, right, this is level three specific, uh, right up here. I could use the same logic of, and if you go back to like the tcache levels, you'll you'll see this. Malik, Malik, uh, free, free. Overwrite next pointer from one. Malik, Malik. Same as one. Uh, this is uh, whatever we overwrote. This pattern, right, is a generic heat pattern if you have a use after free and you're on a singly linked list. Like it's not specific to Tcash. Now the location of this next pointer is different between tcache and the heap. And how we trigger these malics and freeze is different on tcache versus the heap. But what we're taking advantage of is the fact that it does use a singly linked list. And we can, if we have a use after free, right? This is like generic use after free, get me pointer to X. And so we can we can use this approach, right? We can apply some of our kind of generic knowledge of how these data structures work, even though the underlying implementation here, as far as what's going on in memory, is different. Hopefully that um, helps you kind of think about what's going on. Like to me, it really helps to have this, this visual model uh, and you can get you can get tripped up where you're really fixated on like one representation uh, of like the data instead of thinking about how concepts that you've already seen relate. Yeah, uh, chat, chat here says that the problem is you know the new stuff is very intimidating even though it's it's very similar in practice. Yeah, and that that's one of those things where just looking at it and not like one of the pitfalls in that I fall into sometimes when I'm trying to learn something, something new is I get too caught up in like the details of a particular exploit. Like why are they doing this for a particular write-up? And because a write-up will be like very specific about what they're doing. Uh, and something that's very helpful to me 
is to sketch out like what is occurring in, and think about it in as general terms uh, as, as possible. Because a write-up isn't meant necessarily to teach you the underlying concept or how to reason about the systems at play, right? Uh, in, instead, they, they focus very much so on like, this is the critical component uh, that needed to occur. Uh, where I personally like to think of things as like general um, systems. Uh, somebody else here on, on chat says they, they feel like it's more simple. It's, I've had some people say that. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, that simpler is accurate. It, it's just different, right? So, uh, for anyone else here in chat, before I, um, move on from this, this great, um, kind of scribble that I did, does anyone have any questions about the scribble logic? here that was outlining how to kind of think about level three. Uh, somebody says, why KSLR only randomizes three nibbles? Uh, seems brute forcible in theory. So I don't have an answer for why KSLR is only three nibbles, but I will say that if you harden the kernel Right. It's way easier to brute force an address in user land because the entire system doesn't lock up when you fail critically. Right? The program crashes. All right, you try again. You get more attempts. But in the kernel, assuming like you don't have a leak and you're just trying to brute force this, you have a reasonably good chance, especially if panic on oops is enabled. Like you don't get to guess a thousand times. Like brute forcing is less of an option. You know, on a, on a reasonably hardened kernel. Like if you have the ability to start and stop the system, I guess you could, you could start it, uh, try and guess it, and then restart it, and you're in, what is that, 1 in 2 to the 12? But your your time delay there is rebooting the entire system. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, I don't know. Uh, that That's my kind of thinking of it, but I don't have a, uh, you know, a proper uh, technical answer there for you. All right, cool. So nobody had any other questions about that. Let's march on here. What was I doing? Okay, yes, we were looking at level four. Level four uh, does not have uh, the function pointers. All right. So, so the the question is, well, what do we what do we do now? All right. Uh, this program level four is still vulnerable to. Uh, use after free because this is actually level four that we were looking at, and so we see we see here we can call kmem uh, kmem cache free and free it, and again that value isn't getting nulled out. Uh, somebody says, "I guess we rop." Guessing is like not reading man pages. Okay, aside from like speculative execution, we don't need to guess, right? Hopefully we have the tools to verify, understand, and know, right? We can have some type of, even if it's, well, I can eliminate a system, you know, a, a number of options to like five things. We, we can try those five things in order and reason about why something works or doesn't work. Uh, you like guessing it wastes so much time? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a pitfall in general, right? When you're trying to debug something. It's, oh, well, I think it works like this. And, and sometimes you guess and get it right and it saves you time. But the, the way to exhaustively address your problem uh, is definitely 
uh, to spend the time to use the tool to gain facts to then know that you're marching uh, in the correct direction. Sometimes, sometimes properly debugging will take longer than guessing, right? Uh, but I think on average, properly debugging and reasoning about why something behaves a certain way will get you where you want faster. And along the way, you'll learn more things, which causes you to break things less often instead of just, oh, I changed this and it worked. Like there'll be less of that and more, I'm changing this because I know X. Now I can say that, but you'll also see me like randomly change stuff frantically and, you know, uh, create print statements. So it's a do as I do as I say, not as I do, right? Uh, none of us, none of us are perfect. Okay. So this level, we said the problem, like the new barrier here is there are no function pointers. And this is where the last slide deck. So I guess you couldn't solve for without, um, this. But without this slide here, specifically the last two points, which maybe I should put um, earlier here because I, I haven't reworked um, the slide deck yet. So there is functionality in the kernel uh, that's known as bin format. Is anyone familiar with bin format and what bin format does? Somebody says yes, but that person I know I utilize this um, like functionality of the kernel uh, in an unrelated module for something else. And I, I shared that with you. So that's not fair. Uh, so when I run a, I don't care, what are we going to run? When we run bin cat, how does the kernel know that this is an elf? Right? Somehow, the kernel knows that it needs to fire up the uh, elf loader, load this into memory, and do something. And the chat says magic elf header. Yes. And so if we hex edit bin cat, uh, what we see here, just looking at the raw binary, the I the first few bytes here, 7f, 45, 4c, 46. And if we look on the right hand side here, we see elf, right? Uh, the, it's a common pattern to identify your file, which we don't have in Windows. Like in Windows, if I were to touch a.txt, this is now a text file. And if I move a.txt and I rename it to a.exe, this is now an executable file. Right, Windows uh, by convention, the suffix matters, like matters quite a bit. If I move a.exe, now it's not the only way to determine like a file type, but Windows tends to rely heavily um, on file suffixes. It's it's now an image, right? Uh, as far as how we generally like think about it, but in Linux we have the file command and file somehow knows that this is an elf file. And if I were to echo AAA uh, into a.txt and then we file, uh, let's, no, let's not even call it a.txt, let's call it just a. And we run file on a, somehow the file command knows this is ASCII text. Okay, well, what happens if I edit a, and we add a shebang for bin bash, and we make this uh, cat. This won't work, obviously, but cat flag. Well, what is file? What is the file now? Somehow, without changing the name of it at all, A went from being ASCII text to a born again shell script, right? And if I were to um, copy the first few bytes of an elf of an elf file into a and ran the file command file would say hey that's a that's an elf file right? the first few bytes i think it's like the first thousand up to the first thousand bytes or give or take 
Don't quote me on that one. Uh, can be referenced as magic bites, right? We call them magic. And it's the, the earliest bites, typically it's the earliest bites in the file, are used to indicate what is the file type. There's some type of indicative pattern. And that is what the kernel uses uh, to figure out what is going on and how should we interact with this file. Like one of the things that I always thought was that like when I was first kind of learning how, how these things work, is that a shebang, well, that's gotta be handled by bash. That's a bash thing, right? It turns out it's not, right? And we can prove that. If I, uh, I'm gonna call this b.c. We open our man page for exec v. If I include this and we write a simple, super simple function that is just going to call exec v. What does exec v want? Uh, Path name arg v. Okay. So that means uh, arg v. What is this? Char star arg v array is going to equal the home hacker a and then null, I should be able to say argv Oh, come on, there's a nice example in here. Yes, yes. And then, oh, I did hit that. Uh, argv zero, argv. When you start mixing uh, arrays and arrays and pointers, I I can fail. So uh, we run that. Did I do that wrong? Probably. Uh, let's trace a that out. Uh, chmod plus x uh, home hacker a. Okay. Right. We got we got problems, man. Okay. Uh, now we should see that exec v e call. Somewhere in here. Yes. This exec VE call didn't rely on bash. We just exec VE'd the file. And remember, exec VE is a syscall, right? It is from man page two, so it is a syscall. So that file path is getting passed directly into the kernel. So it's the kernel that is figuring out what the heck do we do with this file. And it's the kernel that is interpreting the shebang. It isn't bash. This is actually happening uh, at inside the OS, which is, is super cool. Well, if we were to kind of reason about how does this functionality work, it utilizes something called bin format. And there is a man page for it if you're interested. I think it's, um, is it man bin format? Man bin format miss? It's something like that. Uh, we'll consult the Googs. Uh, man page bin format. Mm -hmm. See also systemd, systemd bin format, I don't want that. Okay, bin format dash D will work. That's the daemon uh, that allows you to add more magic to the kernel. So you say, and this is something that is totally reasonable to do. So like, what if, is this is a 64-bit uh, Intel system. What if I want to run elf 
or not elf, um, ARM binaries on this system. Well, you can't do that, right? Because the CPU uh, it, it uses um, AMD 64 instructions. But we could tell, so somebody says you can make a cross compiler. Sure, so I could take an ARM binary and then cross compile it to x86. That's one thing I could do. But that actually isn't uh, what is typically typically done, right? If I have an actual ARM binary, I can run it on this system. Uh, what you need is to use bin format and tell bin format, yes, you can emulate ARM. Um, my dojo is different than your dojo. I get internet. Um, and so we can search for um, Kimu user, uh, which is a user layer or user land layer uh, emulator where you can emulate binaries. And so there is a Kimu user that will run ARM binaries, but it is an x86 uh, program. Right, the per the emulator itself is an x86, uh, and it in it the emulator runs ARM binaries, very similar to like how uh, the Yon85 VM runs Yon85, but it's on x86. Uh, so maybe this internet is not not the greatest, but in theory, this would come back and show me that there is a Kimu user that can run ARM. I can use uh, this bin format, Damon, and tell the kernel, hey, if you see something that is an elf, that is an arm elf, I want you to automatically run it on top of this emulation layer. And that's super cool. And so that is what bin format, we're going, going off the rails a little bit here, uh, bin format does as a functionality of the kernel itself. But there are a number of things that it will just default try and do. Right, because sometimes you get a file and you don't know that it is, you don't know the magic. And so right here inside of the kernel, uh, we have this search binary handler. And this is where it's looking for the handler that says, well, what do we, what do we, what the kernel's trying to figure out, what do we use? How do we run this thing? And one of the things that uh, it will do here is call this request module, uh, which is underscore underscore request module, if I remember right. So let's, yeah, it's defined right there. And then from here, one of the things that the kernel will try and do is like a last ditch resort is we see right here call mod probe, which is a, a strange thing, a uh, strange thing to do, right? Why would you call mod probe? But uh, if you're unfamiliar, um, oh, that's inside the VM. Give me this will work. Uh, man, mod probe. A uh, mod probe is used to add and remove kernel modules, and so one of the things that the kernel will just decide to do when you execute some unknown file is the kernel will be like, hey, maybe, maybe this thing you're trying to run that we have no idea what it is happens to be a kernel module. So let's see if we can load this into the kernel. Let's see if this makes sense. And this is something that it does by default. Yes, exactly. Last resort, let's add this unknown thing that we have no idea directly to the kernel. Uh, I I don't know. There's probably a perfectly good reason for why the kernel does this, but I I personally don't understand. <laughs> uh, but that that's okay, right? I, I'm not a I'm not a kernel guy. Um, I, I just know uh, know have bits of nuggets here. So, uh, what happens in this call mod probe? Well, if we take a look here, it's a little bit small. Oh, I'm not. I have to make this bigger. How do I make this bigger? Okay, there we go. Hopefully that's a little bit easier to see. Can I go bigger yet? I'm like blind, so uh, big text is great for me. Uh, inside this call mod probe, 
uh, what it will do is it sets up argv, where argv0 is mod probe path. It sets up some arguments. So it's going to run mod probe dash q. Let's see what is dash q. Maybe it doesn't like insert it directly into the kernel. Uh, mod probe won't print an error message when you try and remove or insert a module it can't find. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, man. It, it says run mod probe and be quiet about it. <laughs> uh, I thought there was going to be some greater meaning here, but I, I, I guess not. Uh, and so it's going to try and call mod probe on whatever this, uh, this file path happens, happens to be. But we see that this first argument, argv0, is defined not as a constant string, right? Dash q here, that's a fixed value. But mod probe path, for whatever reason, is a variable. And if we look at it, it just says, hey, this is some uh, you know, external, uh, external string, uh, char array, so it's a string, that exists somewhere in, in the data segment. Okay. Well, what do we know about magic symbols that exist in the data segment? Oh, well, well, we already saw that we can... Uh, yes, I do need to use the, the grep. Uh, we can grep and get the address of init cred. And init cred isn't a function. It's not in the text section. This is something that is in the data section. So that means that if our kernel has symbols, uh, we should be able to find this mod probe path thing. Maybe we do. And so th this is some location in the kernel that's in the data segment. Now, because it's in the data segment here, it is read write. So what does that mean? Somebody says, I see where this is going. Exactly. So we have this address here. We can, that I, I pulled it from uh, proc k all sims, right? Uh, however, uh, if you are in KASLR, you can refer to the beginning of this stream as far as how, to, how do I figure out where the heck this is, right? Um, but I'm not going to go start to finish here. We can... Maybe uh, copy the address that I want. We can examine the string that is at this location. And we see that's what the string is, slash sbin slash mod probe, which makes some sense because if we were to say which uh, mod probe inside of the VM, it actually isn't that. That's awesome. Uh, well, what is sbin mod probe? Is it a symlink? Okay, it's a symlink to bin kmod. And then what is bin kmod? Is this all just symlinks to, okay. Uh, it all symlinks to what kmod? User sbin mod probe. Okay, so it all, it all goes to the same place, right? It goes to, to bin kmod. Uh, but, the, but the point is, is that this string that will be influenced or can um, will will influence execution here is writable. All roads lead to Kmod. Yes. And this is how you learn little nuggets, right? I didn't know that. I didn't assume. I checked it and I went, oh, okay. Well, that's weird. And now I have this nugget of information if I ever have to interact with this particular um, you know, mess of things in the future. Trust, but verify. Okay, so if we saw from the grand scribble here, uh, we can use a leverage or use after free to deter, to um, make the heap return a pointer to wherever we want and assuming we can read or write uh, to the object that is returned from the allocation uh, that gives us an arbitrary read or arbitrary write. In the scenario we were describing here in level three, uh, we were using that arbitrary read or arbitrary write to overwrite a function pointer that happened to be located on the heap. But if we don't have a function pointer on the heap, there are other things in the kernel that we can use and abuse. And so one of those things would be 
this magic string that happens to exist there. So let's see. Can I do this? Let's see if my GDB foo is, uh, is good enough. No. Okay, that's my address. We want to set this address. Let's see if it is good. To be equal to, mm, let's say, I don't know, what do we want? Home hacker A. Does that work? No symbol. Evaluation requires the program to have a function malloc. No. Mm. Is that dereferencing? Does that work? No. How do I get the literal string there? Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. I want to do this. I'm, I'm committed. I could probably, can I set it to like one? Is it just mad that it's a string? The one thing I don't like about lift operand is not nil value, right? That's why this should be a pointer. And then if we will, so I can set it to a number. It won't let me set it to a string. Does somebody, yeah, go byte by byte. Yeah, that sounds so lame. GDB should let me, let me do this, but it won't. Okay, so uh, I don't need these magic offsets anymore. You are now in a Python window. We should be able to say, what do I want? Home hacker A, uh, my string is going to equal this, and then give me, I am blanking here. Uh, what do I want? I don't know. I'm blanking on how, how to dump this out as a... I want U64. Uh, give me from Pwn. Import star. Oh, wait, wait. Somebody has some magic here. Stack Overflow says I can do... Okay. I want to try to do it in GDB. That sounds way cooler. Okay, so I know the first half of that syntax. Um, oh, is it just mad about the type? No, so it does want it to be char array, one, two, three, four, too many array elements. So it does care about the null byte. So this um, this syntax right here, I recently learned about the, the old curlies uh, in, in case you, one of the things you've probably seen me do is something like, this and then you provide a pointer. Uh, the curlies uh, are shorthand for this right here, doing doing kind of the cast and dereference. So what we're doing here is we are saying we want this to be. Uh, what do I? How many letters do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen plus the null byte. So apparently fifteen, and then we give it our address and we'll set that to home hacker a oh that is lovely that that is a good bit of wisdom there so then we verify we examine the string there okay so now uh you know we would obviously for our challenge exploit thank you very much for that um chat uh now from our, we would 
somehow managed to perform this overwrite uh, by getting a primitive from the heap, right? So let's assume we've somehow done that. How do I then abuse this? Well, the, the key was, is that I have some file that the kernel doesn't know what the magic is. So let's make that. We are in Home Hacker. We're going to echo just a bunch of uh, FF bytes uh, to um, what is this? It shouldn't be actually to A. It should be to what is this? Because this is the file that I'm going to kind of trip up the kernel on. And then the path that I've specified in mod probe path is the thing that I want to execute. So this needs to be like a bad, a shell script is a good, um, good thing to do here. Uh, let's see if we can ch mod the flag for everyone. And so what I have now, there are two things. Uh, what is this? which I also need to make what is this executable because that's what triggers this functionality. And so when I am in the VM here, which now has mod probe path overwritten, if I try and execute what is this, what should happen is it will try and run it and then it will call uh, the thing that's located at mod probe path which in turn executes this script, which managed to chmod the entire flag. Right. Uh, and just to show that this wasn't like some trickery here, let's set it back as root. So, uh, right now, it is only accessible by um, by root. Now we run the, and what we're running here with what is this, again, if we take a look at what is this, it's just FFFF, okay, somehow we got a null byte in there because of how I ran the echo, right? It is literally just garbage. And so we're trying to execute garbage here up in the VM. And the kernel's like, okay, we don't know how to deal with this garbage. What is this garbage? We don't know. It's not an elf. Uh, let's try and see if the kernel <laughs> the kernel wants it. And so we call this mod probe path. So what's happening is we're executing uh, home hacker A dash Q dash dash. And then um, what is this? That is what's being executed. And since it is a shell script that I control, my shell script doesn't care about these extra arguments. My shell script's just gonna rock and roll and ch mod the flag. So we run, what is this, which is garbage. The kernel doesn't know what to do. The kernel calls mod probe path, which happens to now be my script that I control, uh, which then runs ch mod on the flag. And we're good. Now, mod probe path is something that's like been in the kernel for, I don't know, a long time. Like I, I knew about mod probe path um, before like working on this module. Uh, and there, there are these kind of like little tricks or nuggets of kernel functionality or functionality that are interesting to abuse or have some like distinct property that makes it interesting as something to play around with. Because oftentimes when you're doing kernel, um... <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat that one, but I, I like that one, Twitch. Uh, uh, there's, there's, so there's, there's like these little secret nuggets of wisdom or different functionality that you become familiar with inside of the kernel. And these are different pieces of functionality that you can trigger, right? So if I had a kernel exploit, my kernel exploit, or not a kernel exploit, my uh, heap kernel heap exploit, I'm what I'm doing with the heap is getting a arbitrary read or arbitrary write to then go mess around with some other functionality of the kernel that I know I can abuse 
to accomplish my objective, right? In this case, I just needed to get arbitrary execution and we did it via um, mod probe path. And so when you look at the, which is definitely worth checking out, uh, the recommended reading links, it can initially seem I kind of like there's this just mess of stuff and how do, how do I map this to the challenges that I'm actually solving? Well, consider what functionality is being used from these different like sub parts of the kernel. Uh, like one of the very common things, uh, which will definitely be in the pre-recorded lecture videos um, that is mentioned here is message message. Right? You're like, okay, well, what the, what the heck is message message and why do I care? Well, the first five levels here, if we were to look at the cache that is being used, inside, where am I, init module, we are creating our own cache, right? It's its own private cache for these kheap objects. And we can see that inside of the VM here. Boop, boop. If we look at the head of prox lab info, uh, we'll see that there is this kheap object cache. And that is what we're interacting with. And this is both great and horrible, right? It kind of depends upon how, how you think about dealing with the heap. Having a dedicated cache where this is the only thing that, the only thing that can exist on this cache is kheap objects is great for us thinking about the layout of slots on the slab and how kernel objects relate to each other because we're the only ones that are messing around with these slots. Right? The only way a slot gets allocated is if we do it and the only way a slot or a object gets freed is if we do it. And so that's great for kind of building this initial understanding. But if we were to take a look, I don't really want to blow away my great team up session, uh, but if we were to take a look at level six where it says now we're working on the real kernel. Uh, what we'll find is that instead of calling kmem cache create and creating a dedicated cache, we are calling kmalloc to allocate uh, on open. Where's open? Um, so this is calling kmem cache allocate, which is creating an object from that specific kheap cache. But in levels, what is it, six? Yeah, six onward, we're just calling kmalloc. And kmalloc doesn't use a dedicated cache. kmalloc uses, uh, you're not in the VM, you are, uh, sudo cat proc slab info grep kmalloc. Uses these kind of general purpose caches. Now there's a reason that you may be in a kmalloc CG versus a generic kmalloc uh, that's mentioned in the lecture videos. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that when we allocate something, and I'm not saying that it's on 4K, um, let's grab one of the smaller ones that has a decent number of objects. So this one right here. Uh, this is a general purpose cache for 64 byte kernel objects. So if in our kernel module, we happen to allocate 64 bytes, it's going to go to this cache. What happens if I trigger some syscall and internally in the kernel functionality, it needs a 64 byte object. There's a decent chance that it will allocate it to this cache. And so now we have this both problem and feature, depending upon how you look at it, of other objects can be allocated on the same slab that I'm interested in. And so our kind of mental model for reasoning about these scenarios expands from, and I don't know that it's 64 bytes or that any of these uh, objects actually uh, can be overwritten, 
um, we could have a K heap object here, and then we could have, for instance, a um, message object over here. And maybe we have, I don't know, what's uh, some other kernel object? I don't know too many um, kernel objects. But message message is a particularly um, good one for this purpose. Uh, and it's used in a number of exploits, uh, which is why we see write-ups linked here that discuss it. And so we can leverage the properties of various kernel objects to force actions that would otherwise not occur. And that is where it is both horrible because now I don't necessarily, I have less knowledge about the state of the slab that I'm on, but at the same time, I have more power because there's more things that I can try and place. There's more kernel objects or types of kernel objects that I can try and place on the slab. And so it becomes uh, a bit of a puzzle as far as, okay, well, what kernel functionality or what kernel object do I want to allocate on, on the heap? Uh, and there's, there's two that are mentioned, but the general idea here is there are properties that are interesting or desirable for us uh, as far as what kernel objects do we want to try and get on the heap. Well, it'd be great to have some type of kernel object where I can influence the size of the object. Because if I can influence the size of the object, I can control what cache, what cache that object will end up in. Right? And so that's a desirable property. Uh, something else that I may be interested in is, well, what if the object that I managed to get here on, on the slab has a function pointer, right? We already saw in levels, what, one through three, one and two, um, that there is value if there's a function pointer located on the heap, right? That becomes a juicy target uh, to gain control flow. And so maybe the kheap object doesn't have a function pointer, but if I can get some other object over here, right, uh, some object, boop, uh, with a function pointer. If I can get some object with a function pointer on that same slab, that suddenly provides me with a target that I didn't otherwise have. And so we start thinking about, well, what are the properties of different objects that we can get into memory on the heap? And it becomes, it becomes both a lot more freeform, um, but also it requires you to just have knowledge of this kernel functionality. Like uh, what I just described a little bit ago, you just had to know about mod pro, right? And if you don't, well, then you're gonna have a bad time, but maybe you know some other kernel functionality that you could use uh, once you have an arbitrary read or arbitrary write. Uh, and that, that's what we start thinking about when we say, how do we leverage a heap exploit into kind of greater, or a kernel heap exploit into greater kernel exploitation? Uh, so hopefully that was a decent rant. Does anyone have any specific questions? I don't even know how long I went. I know I started like at five. What time is it? Oh, not too bad. Uh, like, it's like six, 620. Uh, does anyone have any other questions about like the first half of the module or something that they, uh, they want to take a look at? Uh, question, kernel oops should be trivial. So the challenge description doesn't say it, which I I may change. Uh, it just isn't super high on my to-do list at the moment. The first, the first four levels, I deal with our will oops. They'll oops and they'll happily oops. Level five, is configured the kernel from five onward the kernel is configured uh such that um the kernel will panic on oops okay. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you can't oops. The kind of key nugget, so for like three, you should be able to oops it pretty, pretty easily, right? Um, just just make make it access some, some memory that's invalid, and, and as long as you aren't breaking it and causing it to panic and it manages to recover, uh, you'll, you'll get some nice um, D message output that you can also find in the VM logs. Uh, but for the five onward, it becomes this weird, again, it's kind of a magic, magic knowledge that, that I just have to kind of share with you here is that the way that the kernel decides like something is recoverable or unrecoverable that logic is, is quite complicated, right? And one of the things that the kernel will do when it's trying to figure out what the heck is going on is it will look at the context of the current running process, right? So if a process um, creates a couple of kernel objects, uh, the process then uh, overwrites stuff, the process then um, directly tries to allocate that stuff. All of those actions occurred in a single process. And so the kernel's context for kind of reasoning about what's going on is, hey, this was definitely supposed to happen. This one process did it. It tried to do it. This is a deliberate action inside of the kernel. This was meant to happen. This is, there, there's no rolling this back. This is clearly a deliberate action. And you may get one behavior from the kernel, like a panic in that type of scenario. But if instead you leverage multiple processes, so like one process is uh, performing um, allocations, another one is performing uh, freeze, and then the first one then is using that, that memory or so, you know, something to that degree, you start making the scenario a bit messier so that there's multiple processes involved, then the kernel's logic for reasoning about how the heck did we get here becomes muddied and it may not recognize um, the situation as completely unrecoverable. If that isn't enough to get people past, uh, like from five onward, then we'll revisit that in office hours. And uh, so my, my plan as far as like things that we're gonna focus on timing is this week is kind of one through five and biasing to the earlier half since I still have office hours on Friday. Uh, and then this is running for yet another week. Uh, and so next week uh, we'll take a look at, uh, as far as class time and demonstrations, uh, we'll take a look at working with the general purpose caches and why some of these objects are interesting. And unless you guys just manage to blow through it and hit, you know, the bulk of the class is at level six uh, come come Friday, then we'll we'll, we'll jump ahead. Uh, but that's my general idea for the pacing. All right. Any any other questions from Twitch chat? I'll give it. Uh, a few moments, and if not, we'll call it there. Again, this was your, your kind of free makeup stream since the internet uh, died uh, yesterday. I guess there's one more thing that I'll mention. Um, things get tricky when um, we start talking about KASLR, and this is why I'm not going like super into tooling. There's another tool that I installed or like threw on the dojo that is kind of interesting, but I don't, I don't want you to rely on it. And that is libslub. Uh, so libslub on uh, GitHub, libslub. Uh, libslub is a library that allows you to kind of print out uh, slab data and cache data from, from the kernel. However, what I found is that it is a bit finicky, at least in its um, current environment. I did manage to get it to work on level one. So let's um, see if it will behave.
VM debug. Okay. Uh, so we can source lib slub lib slub dot pi. And it will either return and be happy or it's going to yell at me about kernel versions. I think it'll be happy on level one. The commands for libslub lib all start off with sb. So there's like sb uh, list, uh, sb object, and sb list is uh, the command that I think is um, particularly interesting uh, because it will show us several things. Uh, let's filter this down to like kmalloc8. Okay. The, oh, that's not a good one, is it? It's not changing. The nice thing here is when we cat when we do cat proc slab info, those values aren't um, those values aren't uh, like the object in use. They aren't like real time dynamic. It's kind of like the ceiling that we see. But if we use lib slub, uh, the values that are shown uh, do update in real time, and so we can see the number of objects that are actually um, allocated against the cache. And then you can also uh, print out the free list. Let me see if I can find that one real quick. It's SB cache. So SB cache, then is with dash N, yeah. Uh, dash N, kmalloc8. And by default, it's not going to show me the free list, but it shows me uh, that kmm uh, cache struct and then it will also show me the Kmem cache CPU, so it's doing that math for us. Uh, but again, remember with um, KASLR, this will not not be happy. Uh, I think it's show free list. Let's just let's ignore documents and guess. Um, okay, so the free list has zero elements there. That's that's kind of lame. Um, what is no. hit the red button? There we go. Uh, this is the free list uh, for that cache. The, the lockless free list is the free list that is dedicated for that particular CPU. Uh, I realized that I just uploaded it um, earlier today, so you may have not seen it, uh, but the Cache, when we think about it as this overarching struct um, or overarching kind of object or reasoning system, can be split into two halves where one of them is like the working data uh, of what we are currently using. Uh, and so that is the, the lock list free list. That's the free list that the CPU is allowed to uh, allocate from, and it doesn't have to worry about having contention uh, with other CPUs. And so we can now see the free list for this particular cache. This one's quite large. Right? Um, and so you can use this as a tool to introspect. I'll tell you that I don't use it, uh, but I know some people are really itching to have um, you know, some type of magic tool that's going to output some data. Uh, so in the earlier challenges, if you're just dead stuck and want to have some tool that's going to uh, print out the, the free list, you can use uh, libslub. Again, it's just on GitHub. Uh, it's libslub. Uh, personally, what I would recommend doing if you're trying to debug this stuff, uh, instead of relying on a magic tool, uh, would be uh, what do I want? Kheap. Okay, uh, all sims. Uh, would be to set a breakpoint inside the kernel module that you're interested in and um, reasoning about, or setting, I'm sorry, not reasoning, uh, setting a breakpoint at, so like if I grab in here, 
I like using raw GDB over libslub, but I also haven't ran into a scenario where like I need a ton of this this output. Um, if we examine twenty instructions right here, like for these challenges, you don't, certainly don't. Um, I like using bare bones GDB and then just like setting a breakpoint at the address that I'm interested in, uh, which is actually not going to be 210, but it'd be 215. So right after the allocation. And then I can just look at the pointer that's returned from KMM cache alloc, uh, which is going to be a pointer into, uh, already, um, into one of the slots that was returned uh, for the, um, allocation, right? And then I can examine the memory that's there. And so if I just break here and then capture all of the pointers that are returned in just raw GDB, right? Um, and like set it to be a, a variable or whatever, I can then start examining the data relative to the pointers that are returned. I like looking at it that way uh, because then I can see the raw bytes. I can uh, do math and compute like the, the distance from the beginning of the object or from the pointer that was returned. And then I can dump out a whole bunch of bytes and I can see that next pointer. And then I could like do math from the beginning of the kernel object or free kernel object to where that next pointer is, is located. But again, I really like having kind of that visual dump so that I can think about what is going on uh, at, at a high level. It, it helps me where something like, here's a whole bunch of pointers uh, that are that are on the, on the free list. Like I get what's going on there, but this doesn't help me visualize kind of the structure of what's going on inside of memory. So that was just like a, a quick aside because I don't think I'm going to mention that on the pre-recorded, um, but it, it's there. Uh, yeah. So if there's nothing else, I'll leave you all there. Hopefully that's enough to uh, get you rocking and rolling through the first half of the challenges here. So this should get you uh, somewhere around level five. Uh, with that, I'll leave you. I appreciate you hanging out with me. Uh, sorry about the delayed stream. Uh, so with that, goodbye and good luck.